Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. And I uh, want to congratulate you on uh, uh, and thank you for that talk and those insights. Um, it's always difficult for laymen going after a doctorate. Uh, there's a reason why they have to defend their thesis and the skills they get therein. So I'm hesitant uh, to bring it up. But uh, the discussion is also about the impact this is going to have on commodity trading, um, which is usually a little shorter duration. Like if you think about the slide that you put up of the Easter parade, it's a 13-year delta in time, which is a duration not all of us are afforded in terms of dealing with the returns for our investors. Um, and also, while uh, Abraham Lincoln did do some um, marvelous things for changing our country, the end effect wasn't great for him personally. So in terms <laughs> of uh, the consequences of that. So one of the things to think about in terms of uh, ourselves as fund managers okay, is, well, first off, should we start off by having each of you all introduce yourselves briefly? Please, Dr. Dr. Gretz, you already done. Uh, sure, my name's uh, Alex Selsik. I work at uh, Geosol Capital. It's a discretionary uh, electricity and natural gas trading firm. So uh, a lot of the stuff we talk about in my peers in electricity trading, it's uh, a lot of it is uh, sort of, sort of a lot of information was new in terms of how fast you see some of that stuff coming, but we'll discuss that more on the panel. Uh, I'm John Goldberg. I'm the CIO of BBL Commodities. We're a commodity hedge fund. I'm Adam DeChiara. I'm the founder of Core Commodity Management. Uh, we're the largest independent commodity asset manager in the world, and we're headquartered up the street in Stanford. And I want to thank my panelists. It's difficult since I read repeatedly in the newspaper that commodity funds are going through an extinction event and that we're dinosaurs. So for us to be able to find you know, three to four of us is actually, I think, a rare sighting. Um, so uh, I'd like to start just by asking, you know, in terms of what Dr. Crates brought up and discussed, is the aspect of whether you see this um, materially impacting. Let's start with just the renewable energy side, um, the commodity trading markets, and the opportunity set in, let's say, the next two to two and a half years, taking us through the end of this decade. Um, do you see what he's talking about, you know, really transforming the markets which you're involved in? And, for lack of things, we can go sequentially if you'd like. Sure, um, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not just now beginning. It's been happening. Um, I'm from Texas. My background is in the Texas power market. We have, um, people don't think about Texas this way, but we have an unbelievable renewable penetration in Texas already. We have roughly 25% of the state's installed capacity is already renewable wind generation. The solar, um, the solar installation is just now happening. The capital expenditures have really started in the last two years on that. Um, we're basically doubling the amount of solar capacity we have on a grid basis, grid-based solar, every year right now, starting from zero, but you know, zero, then 100, then 200, then 400 this year, it's gonna be 800. I mean, it's, so, you know, do the math on that. It, it, it impacts the market very quickly. Um, the, you know, there's the, the concept of, some of, your, some of your slides, it's talked about net zero energy. The net is a tricky word um, when it comes to grid reliability. If you, uh, one of the things that has enabled, you know, the US economy to thrive is energy reliability. If you get into a scenario where you're discouraging use um, to obtain net zero or use of at certain times because of constraints um, for, say, peaking demand needs, things like that, that does have economic consequences. So the, con the concept of completely zero dollar marginal cost energy does have some mandatory economic consequences if it's causing shifting of demand. And there's no opportunity to change that behavior via a price mechanism. Um, so that's, it's a, uh, it's not to say that anything he said is untrue. It is all true that the technology is fantastic. It's great. I think that the concept of net zero, though, and, and zero dollar energy price at the same time has behavioral and economic consequences um, if we get there too quickly, especially. And there could be tremendous rebound effects and potentially very regressive economic impacts. Um, regressive meaning if there is a, a zero cost option and there becomes a price for additional demand, even the supply is free, but you have to demand shift, what's gonna happen is high income people are gonna basically buy out the power from people who can't afford to, and then you're gonna have uneconomic demand shifting that's very regressive. That's something that a policy maker would probably be highly against if we got there too quickly. One thing before we move to you, John, I would push back on one thing in that, as we've seen, it's not a zero bound. We've seen power trade negative here. Absolutely. So, it isn't just zero, it is, it is, there is that aspect. But if I was just to sort of more fine tune your answer, your answer is definitively you've seen it in the power markets already. Absolutely. In terms of a segment. All right, we have zero, we have negative power in West Texas all the time right now. It's, a lot of it is a transmission related constraint. 
Uh, even if that were to go away, you could still end up with negative pricing. That's because of subsidies. There's federal tax credits that allow wind generators to actually make money at a negative, negative energy price currently. So that's, again, that's policy, not necessarily economics. Uh, I, I mean, I think that the answer is definitively yes, but with different degrees, different timelines, depending on the market that you look at, power, gas, electricity, uh, the most directly impacted and with the shortest time frame. Oil, there's definitely an impact from EVs, but it's more a oil demand would be higher now, uh, but for uh, analysis as opposed to a rapid decline in oil. Um, the Chinese bus example is a, a good example. Uh, you know, there's 6,000 buses in New York area and 16 in Chezuan, and it's, we estimate it's about 250 to 300,000 barrels a day of oil demand that we would have had otherwise if it hadn't been for electric vehicle displacement in the sort of Chinese transport uh, system writ large, uh, which is a lot, uh, but oil demand is still growing uh, by about 2 million barrels a day. Um, one thing I think when it comes to oil, though, that we need to be careful about on these analyses is the scope, the scale, and also what other factors go into oil demand. So like the Tony Seba paper was, was interesting and thought-provoking, as was the discussion, but um, oil demand is actually can be more sensitive as you go through a longer period of time to things like GDP growth, population growth, um, tariffs and trade policies. Uh, it, it's not just an EV scenario. And I don't think any of us would presume to know what, we, what GDP is going to be in 2040 or 2050. So to say that we know what both GDP is going to be and what electric vehicle penetration is going to be is a really, really tall task. Um, it's also not tradable, uh, so we, uh, we don't have positions in it. So uh, John, I thought it was interesting that you started with a, uh, a quote from Shakespeare. Um, and I'd like to start with a quote from Mark Twain, which is, to paraphrase, the death of petroleum has been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> um, let's look at electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, there's currently you know, just over a billion light vehicles out there in the world today. Electric vehicles represent about 25 basis points of that total supply. And I can't talk to 2050, so I won't even attempt. 2050, we could all be infusion-powered cars. So, and, and two years, I think, there's no discernible impact. So, so let me pick something sort of more intermediate. Let's say between now and 2025, if we assume that there is steady growth and adoption of purely electric vehicles to the point where by the time we get to 2025, one out of every 10 cars sold in the world is purely electric. Okay? As we model that, that'll get the global percentage of the total light vehicle fleet to about 3%. And that's being, I think, conservative. And there are reasons why I don't think we're going to get to that 10% number in basically seven years. But if we got to that point, we would be displacing in 2025 roughly 1 million barrels per day of global petroleum consumption. You say, well, that sounds like a lot. Today, as we sit here, the world produces and consumes roughly 100 million barrels of petroleum a day. And that number has been going up every single year, every single year, with the exception of 2008, for the past 35 years. And in 2010, after the you know, depths of the crisis, consumption went up 3.6%, so we're right back on that trend. So what that means is, seven years from now, the world is going to be consuming somewhere, in all likelihood, north of 110 million barrels of crude oil per day. And if a really aggressive adoption of electric vehicles occur, about a million of that will be displaced. You know, just to put that in context, the decline in production from Venezuela exceeds that. You know, a million is just not all that much in the short run. I don't, I don't mean to disagree because I can't. No one can disagree with this concept that 30, 40, 50 years from now, the entire global energy infrastructure may have to change and it may in fact change. But as it relates to, to the shorter term, I don't really think it's, it's all that relevant. And, and just one other quick point, which is one thing we haven't talked about as it relates to transportation is aviation. Aviation counts for about 17% of global petroleum usage as far as transportation goes, okay? This year, four billion people will fly on airplanes. That's compounding at an annual rate of three and a half percent, which means by 2036, that number is gonna be eight billion, okay? And I don't, you know, maybe there will be a non-fossil fuel-based pro propellant system. You know, even, even Elon Musk uses fossil fuels to shoot his rockets up. So I don't think with the growth of aviation, and, and frankly, there are 
incredible positive benefits to the world from that. You know, the internet and, and the ability to interact with people from all over the world has been a great development, but the incredible increase in mobility for people to actually go from one country to another, in terms of what that does for the global sense of community, that's fantastic, and that is going to continue, and that's going to continue to increase the demand for, for petroleum. So I was really successful in trying to keep us focused on just the renewable side and coming <laughs> back to EV separate. But it's, it's a good illustration in that the uh, swath and wide range of a conversation such as yourself and some of the overlap that comes in, um, people tend to rotate the thought because the discussion of renewables and what that's going to mean in terms of electricity generation is separate from the electrical vehicle, okay? And that also unto itself has some delta in terms of electricity demand or not, okay? Um, and so I was, I was trying to keep things bifurcated as much as I could at, at first, okay? Um, so I'd like to come back to EV and crude and, and something separately in terms of the pace of when it's going to be material and impact and then just focus on the renewable side. For the amount that you guys trade natural gas or power, okay, you know, do you have any view that for that segment, at least in the next two to two and a half years, we're going to see the effect of renewables becoming a bigger share either in increase or diminution of volatility or liquidity or outright price? So, um, Sure. Um, so obviously, the, it's net bearish to price. Um, so that's that's pretty clear because you have zero marginal cost. The, the renewables are characterized by capital cost up front and then zero marginal cost, or even negative if you have tax credits, right? So so that seems pretty clear. The uh, the volatility dampening um, that depends and it gets tricky. Um, rooftop solar or utility scale solar um, in a summer peaking area like Texas, where I'm from. Um, clearly can dampen summer volatility and should dampen summer volatility. Um, so that, that's fairly clear. Does it, if, if you start to have disruption events that put you know, the old utility models out of business, which has already started, we just had three coal plants retire literally three months ago in Texas. Um, and so as that continues, what happens when, the, when you become more dependent on solar and you have something like morning peaks? We have a huge, actually, believe it or not, electric heating demand ramp in the state of Texas in the winter. So when you have cold fronts come through, a couple things happen. First of all, heaters kick on overnight, there's no solar power, so you need some sort of storage mechanism to replace what used to be gas or coal generation. Um, also, when cold fronts come through, what uh, typically happens, it comes through the west part of the state, cold front has rain on the frontal boundary, freezes behind it, all the wind ices up, and you have no wind generation. So and this, is a, this has actually already happened. This happened this past January. We had our first uh, $9,000 power prints in the wholesale market, uh, which is a system cap in Texas. So, so yes and no in terms of the volatility opportunity. Over the long term, which I think is really more what you were talking about, technology should help smooth, the, smooth the, some of those things out. Uh, you know, demand shifting is real, but people, people aren't necessarily gonna select to demand shift when they're, when they're on a fixed price power product. They don't have a price signal to. No one cares. If you just have a, an eight cent per kilowatt hour rate, why are you gonna let your house get down to 65 degrees or not run your appliances? You don't care what wholesale prices are. It's irrelevant to you at that moment in time. So that technology will change behavior when people get a price signal. And that technology has not penetrated yet. I agree with you, it is coming way faster. There's actually a product in Texas already, a marketer selling something called Gritty, and they will put you on the spot market and allow you, they have apps where you can actually get, control your house like a smart home and manually change like your air conditioning behavior, your lighting, all of that by, with a little app that says, hey, power prices just spiked, shut your, shut your stuff down, you can go on and, and do it. So that's just starting, it's brand new, that's only been in Texas for about a year. But, um, you know, that, so that will grow and get better and better to alleviate some of those problems. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add. I mean, we tend not to trade gas past the current sort of storage season, um, but structurally, uh, yeah, I mean, renewables are bearish and we do think we'll reduce volatility and change the kind of the shape of the vol curve where you'll see less of a premium for particular events if there's uh, an excess of capacity. Yeah, again, don't disagree in the long term, but again, let's take 2025. Um, if we assume 8% for solar and wind, that's a little higher than some estimates I've seen, but let's go with that. Assume that doubles in the next seven years, which I think is aggressive. If the nonlinear scenario plays out and it quadruples, then you know the, all bets are off. But let's assume that doubles. Global power consumption, however, will still rise such that you will need more 
non-solar and wind to fill in, right? So the big shift that we've seen there from a, from a clean technology standpoint is this movement from coal towards natural gas, right? Since 2000, U.S. power on the power side of your 40% U.S. power CO2 emissions are actually down 21%. That's almost entirely due. Some of it is due to sort of clean coal, but the vast majority of that is due to the adoption of natural gas, which through new technology has become much more plentiful. But in the next year or two, just in terms of the supply demand and analyzing something like natural gas as a PM, um, you know, the, the weather next winter will be far more outcome determinative than the, the incremental at the beginning changes in not, you know, wind and solar. Yeah, and the one aspect in terms of volatility also is, you know, a $1 move on a $1 commodity is a lot more than a $2 move on a $4 commodity. And so in terms of pure percent volatility as we measure it, I'm, I'm not convinced on that. Dr. Green, it's one thing you spoke about in terms of this being a, a better, smoother, more peaceful, ideal world is if I take a look at power sources which are blended in origin for uh, coal, natural gas, nuke, you know, some renewables, you know, uh, tiny percentage of crude, and I look at the origin and sources and points for that, um, which are diverse uh, in, in multiple different ways, mm -hmm. and I compare that to renewables, where there is an over 80% market share dominance by China in wind turbines, in uh, you know, photovoltaic, in terms of solar, in terms of you know, EV for batteries, and aren't I creating greater concentration geopolitical risk by moving more towards a renewable world? than uh, as we are today? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, right? It, the industrialization of renewables has become a national strategy for China, right? And their goal internally is to ensure that they solve their choking cities problem first, right? But at some point, the capacity that they've created is going to shift to the global marketplace in a much more significant way. They've rebalanced, you know, some of the solar is coming into the United States from China right now. Actually, more of it is coming in from Japan and Korea uh, and Vietnam uh, factories right now relative because China is in a self-supply mode. Um, so on that particular commodity, there is a, there's a, a question. But there is no doubt that there's a concentration here. Um, and, you know, the difference is that, you know, once it's installed, it's a local nationalized asset. So you don't have the same type of geopolitical risk that you would have unless you're planning on further growth. Now, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. And I, I, the picture that I painted is, it could be a five-year picture. It's more likely a 10-year picture. It could be a 20-year picture. I can't tell you when exactly all these switches start to happen. I know some of them, you know, like uh, the gritty example, can start to happen really quickly, right? Um, especially when, when we start moving at the speed of software rather than the speed of asset deployment, right? That should start to scare. But in the near term as well, there are clear implications of a very rapidly growing distributed solar market where we can say, you know, near term market volatility may actually be higher with solar because of that uh, shift and disruption of the peak and pushing everything into the late afternoon shoulder that you get. Um, and if you wanted to trade you know, daily around that, you can start to look at trends like that that'll start emerging more quickly. Um, again, uh, there is, as my colleagues here have pointed out, the shifts here, while they are large on an absolute basis, they're small on a relative basis to the contributions to the overall system so far. Um, I, the one place that I would, again, say that's a little different is in China because they're actively, you know, uh, three years ago there were 300, uh, mega, or, uh, 300 gigawatts of coal plants in the pipeline. Today there are 120 gigawatts of coal in the pipeline. Um, they have scaled from three years ago uh, 13 gigawatts of solar input or output and installed to last year uh, 34 gigawatts, uh, or I'm sorry, the year before last to, to 34 gigawatts to last year 53 gigawatts. They're, they're gonna put in, you know, uh, by their own plans by 2040, 1,500 gigawatts of PV and uh, almost that same amount of wind between now and then. These are massive, massive markets that can't help 
if there are sneezes or shifts in China's industrial policy, it's going to affect the world radically in terms of what's available, right? Actually, if I could just ask, um, one of the core parts of your thesis, which I found interesting, was not just that this change is happening, but it's happening more quickly than people think. What does that mean? How do you get a benchmark for what people are thinking in terms of uh, whether it's on the renewable side or on the petroleum side? So if, uh, is it an IEA estimate? What is your measurement for what the, the market or the public is thinking in this? Yeah, I, certainly the conventional wisdom uh, is, is written in the, you know, kind of the trade press and IEA is always a conservative baseline, I would say, relative to where the market is. Um, but, and IEA has always proven conservative on this. I would look to more of uh, the, the mid-market consulting reports as being, you know, more typical with BNEF being on the outer end, right? So there's a 40 million barrel a day bid offer if you look through the different trade publications, yeah. 40 million barrels a day. Yeah is the bid offer on what 2040 oil demand is gonna be. If you take the low end, the, the sort of SIBA analysis, yeah. and the high end, including some of the work that the oil companies do, um, it, that's an unfathomable amount of discretion between those yeah. two. Uh, how would you, oh, I guess, would you take the mean of those things? I, I, I guess I'm, it's unclear what, uh, what it means that, that the market is too slow on this. Yeah. I. You know, it's a good question, and when I when I think about it, right, um, it is more from uh, the perspectives of reactions to the analysis and the work that we've done historically. You know, that would be my guide and my my benchmark. So I'm not looking at the spread there in a 2040 time frame. Um, John, I might look at it a couple different ways to come back in that. We had Tony Siva come by our office. And I'd say that his work is rather than quantitatively based, yeah. is much more belief system based. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, there was no real drill down in terms of the quantitative support therein. Um, but all that being said, you know, there's a number of things. You know, people always look at compounding demand growth without assuming that somewhere in the next one to five years there will be a recession. Yep. So it's not a straight line, which it was probably more relevant to those numbers when and how and how severe. Yep. And then uh, the other aspect that we fix it on is, for us it's really that is, what's the inflection point where demand growth goes negative? Because when a commodity market goes negative, then you're just in hell, because you, now you're looking for the disincentive price. And, and so that's really you know, what we're trying to solve for. And we believe uh, cyclically adjusted, so let's hold recession on one side. It's not incipient, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Pursuant to Adam's point. I mean, I do think that there's a number of issues that are curving or shaping uh, demand, such as ride sharing or the bus comment that you made. So, you know, uh, I am curious for yourselves in terms of this is, is how much do you think technology changes here are impacting demand growth here in the near term on the aggregate petroleum demand? Because there's a huge amount of the information connectivity and all the way throughout and that we actually think that the efficiency of the new cars so internal combustion, hybrid, and PHE is going to matter more than pure EV on a two to five year window. I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts. Yeah, so, so MPG uh, you know, has basically flattened out in the US and light vehicles at about 25 miles per gallon. And that's purely a function of the drop in gasoline prices, right? So you know, back in 2008, um, when gasoline prices first spiked above $5 uh, a gallon, you could go to the Greenwich train station down the road, probably the wealthiest commuter train station in, in the United States, and see people lined up 12 deep to get on the trains because psychologically, 550 a gallon, you know, $90 and two credit card pushes to fill up the car had a real impact on demand. Since oil prices have come off and gasoline prices come off over the past half dozen years, you know, two thirds of all light vehicles sold in the U.S. now are either light trucks or SUVs. So those trends. In order for that, that demand destruction to occur, you're going to have to see a sanction. You're going to have to see a, a higher petroleum price. But the, the other aspect, as it specifically relates to technology, you know, there was a question earlier about batteries. And you know, your response as, was basically the batteries aren't going to matter all that much. And in terms of your two sort of pillars, 40% power, 40% transportation, I, I'm with you that eventually, through technology, you may be able to have less of a need for storage for these renewables than you have now by more efficient management. 
But as it relates to transportation, I don't, I don't see the physics there. I'd be interested in your view of that. You need, you need batteries, okay? And, and in looking at the very incremental penetration right now of electric vehicles and batteries generally across the economy, um, we've seen lithium prices go up by 150%. We've seen cobalt prices go up by 300%. Um, you know, and, and cobalt, you know, is, is also a whole humanitarian disaster right now going on in the Republic of Congo, right there with child labor and other things. So absent, if, if a new technology doesn't emerge on the battery front, something really transformative and disruptive, how do you see us getting to the point where the transportation 40% really starts to look different in, in, in the next few years? I'm not talking sort of 50 years from now with you know, electric share cars and all that, but just in the near term. Yeah, I mean, the, the size and scale of market development here is, uh, is causing a lot of pressure in the commodity markets. And certainly, uh, lithium and cobalt are the two most notable ones. Um, the, uh, you know, when we think about the demand that's being created, you know, you have to believe in the end that there, this is one of the most heavily invested in areas for research and development right now. There are multiple other competing technologies that are starting to emerge. Um, you know, in particular, there's, you know, I was most excited about a, a new technology that uses a basic alkaline battery in a, a polymer uh, substrate that actually can regenerate itself, like a lithium-ion battery at a tenth the cost with no rare earth me uh, metals. I don't know when or how that's going to come, but I have to believe in part that some of the, some of the demand that's being driven by the regulatory side of the house is going to have feedback into new market growth and development that disrupts itself in the process. Now that, that said, um, supply chains will become more efficient. We'll get better uh, use out of what materials we pull out in the first place. We'll start recycling more, um, you know, and the immediate near term, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll still continue to scur scour the earth for ongoing, uh, you know, in particular cobalt and lithium supplies and try to secure those. China, you know, is adamant uh, about their near-term goals, um, and they plan to have 5 million EVs on the road by 2020. They plan to add that many a year, uh, a couple years after that, you know, which is about 25% of their new car park every year that would be going in as EVs. Whether the world can hold up to that, you know, is yet to be seen. Um, so I think there's room for substantial innovation on that part. John or Alex, anything in terms of how technology? Um, you know, on the electric vehicle front, I'd rather not talk about the, uh, the oil yep. side of that. That's more of these guys' expertise, not mine. Um, I do think on the electric side of it, it has some really, really interesting uh, applications to how the wholesale electric market could behave as they become more prevalent, um, especially with, you know, uh, plug-in batteries can actually be or plug-in charging stations can be two-way streets. Um, you need technology and software to make that work, but they can actually be effectively a storage resource. You know, if you think about cars in general, you're not in your car most of the time, so it's this potential energy source just sitting there, not doing anything. If you have electric cars that can actually like act where you have your charging station at your parking garage, say at work, actually act as a supply point to the grid, then that actually kind of provides some energy storage. Of course, you get back into what happens when everyone leaves at 4.30 and goes home and plugs their cars to get a spike. Um, but the, and, you know, that's a trading opportunity um, for, you know, for uh, savvy commodity traders. But you know, things like that, th those electric cars will also have uh, demand shifting implications at some point as they become more, more common um, on our electric wholesale markets. Uh, I mean, I would echo the point on the efficiency. I think that was an excellent point. I think that there's this Efficiency is a bigger deal in the near term for oil demand than it is than EVs are by a huge order of magnitude, um, and the fact that U.S. efficiency has sort of plateaued over the last couple of years in line with price declines. We'll see if that changes if prices go higher. I think is a, a significant factor that's not looked at in the um, in the marketplace, and it's a, it's it's quite a big deal. Um, in line with that, I think when we think about longer term energy and oil prices in, in particular, I think we have to consider what happens to demand elasticity if EV penetration, say, happens quicker than the market thinks, whatever it is that the market actually thinks, and prices go down, do we then spur more oil demand because the price goes from $80 to $40? So what are the cyclicalities and cross currents in that, um, in that analysis? And also, 
just one uh, other point. The um, investment dollars, I think we need to, to bear in mind what it, and we're actually pretty negative on long-term uh, oil for different reasons, actually, for, for supply-related reasons, not for demand-related reasons, but I think we need to contextualize the spend. So, I mean, I think there were four SoftBank-related uh, portfolio companies, all great companies, in the slide. Uh, I mean, the Vision Fund is about $100 billion. The annual CapEx upstream is was $600 billion. It's now $350 billion on an annual basis. So I think we need to bear in mind what it keeps to keep the upstream industry uh, going. So if I could uh, transform the question for one question, and that is that you know, the, the framing of this panel was how is technology going to transform the sort of investing and trading of energy capital markets? And to what I alluded to at the beginning is, you know, what's brought up to us a number of times is if you read Andy Hall's letter, he talks about how there is no longer any structural story in crude oil due to the technology change in shale oil being short cycle and, and eliminating that and also the, therefore, the diminution of volatility and the opportunity set for anything fundamental or near term. Other shorter lived and less successful commodity managers, as, as they're you know, dropping the mic, have said that uh, there's no structural story in commodities anymore of any kind, and that machine learning and AI have eliminated all short term trading opportunities. So I'm sort of curious for yourselves in terms of the impact of technology on your investing and trading opportunities. Is that death knell correct, or is there really you know, still an opportunity set here? Um, I'll start with that one. Uh, obviously, I disagree with the, the thesis of it, that you know, maybe there's some sour grapes there, maybe not. I don't know. We see tremendous opportunities in our markets. Uh, we have, you know, uh, in electricity and natural gas, which are, are our markets, um, you know, the volatility in the absolute range of, say, the longer term natural gas prices may be a lot lower than it has been over the last 10 years. That doesn't mean it's not a tradable market. There are, there are fundamental realities of price that are competing with each other at different points in time, and those have to result in certain paths of price over time. For example, you may have a situation where you have very bullish fundamentals in the front of the curve, but similar to like what the oil market looks like, you have very, very bearish long-term structural technological advances that are putting downward pressure on the back of, say, natural gas. For one thing, like it comes for free with oil production, for example, um, in a lot of places. So that could be very bearish, and then you have very different price paths, and you have store, you have spread somewhere in the middle, but storage, gas storage has to be economically reflected somewhere in between those two differences in supply demand at different points in time. So that fundamentally results in two different outcomes, which really just results in an absolute mandatory change in structural path of prices to be fundamentally correct. That doesn't mean that there's no edge anymore. It just means that things have to move and be in one place that's different from terminal value for a period in time and then evolve differently through time. So th there's going to be movement. It may not be uh, $2 moves in cal calendar strips anymore, that, that model may be dead. Um, that doesn't mean there's not a lot of opportunity in trading around fundamental views. Um, so that would be my answer to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of respect for, for those, those guys, but um, I mean, oil's up about 52%, I think, since, uh, since Andy's letter, which is a, a reasonable return, I think, uh, for, for people to, uh, <laughs> to have. Um, so I think the short answer is no. Uh, in terms of the kind of fundamental reasons why oil or commodity trading might be extinct, um, I think the answer is also probably no. I do think it's muted volatility in natural gas more than it has in other markets. I, I don't disagree with that. But in oil, I mean, listen, in the U.S., there's certainly, U.S. shale is certainly a shorter cycle product than other types of uh, oil but there are bottlenecks, there are pipelines that need to be built. There's not, and we're seeing that now, with some parts of the US, the crude markets are trading 10 bucks below uh, WTI. There's certainly infrastructure needs to keep up with shale, and that's not instantaneous. And also business models change, right? So we had a long period of time where shale companies were willing to outspend free cash flow by whatever they could outspend by. Um, it's not that they're the most disciplined companies, but they're much more disciplined, so the behavior changes. Um, over, over time as well. So there are both fundamental changes. I think what I, I agree with them is more the technology and how people trade the market has changed. Uh, there's more people trading the front end of the curve for non-fundamental reasons. Um, that will continue until it doesn't. I think what you do is you adapt. And uh, there's more structural trades that are a lot more interesting to us in the market that aren't as reliant on what like weekly DOE stats will show 
Um, there are more three, six month, maybe 12 month trades, which you can make a lot of money on, um, that we think are great investment opportunities. Yeah, so first I would, I would echo the idea that, you know, a good portfolio manager can make money whether the markets are going up or down. Um, but your question reminded me of one of my favorite all-time commodity quotes, which I, which I wrote down. Thanks to new technology and productivity gains, you might expect the price of oil, like that of most other commodities, to fall slowly over the years. That was from a cover story in The Economist in March of 1999, when crude oil had just fallen from 35 to $12 a barrel. Over the next nine years, it rose 980%. Um, Andy Hall's comment specifically as related to shale, you know, now we're sort of shifting to the technolo technolo technology impact on the supply side. Um, when you talk about shale, sort of, you know, the, the Saudi Arabia of shale, the, the, the aspect of shale that gets by far the most publicity is the Permian Basin, right? That's, that's the low-hanging fruit of shale. They've been producing oil in the Permian Basin for close to a century. And as recently as 2008, 2007, before the first fracked barrel was economically produced, the Permian Basin was still accounting for 1% of the world's oil supply. Now, throughout the entire shale revolution, the first build up to 5 million, the, 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 you know, the, the decline with the price, and now the next surge, right? Permian production is up to about 3% of global crude oil production. It's also not the cheapest 3%, right? It's, it's on the margin at the, at the higher end. Whatever your estimates are, 40, 50, as more volume comes on, those marginal costs go up, right? But the idea that the entire global balance sheet for petroleum would be restricted by new technology that is, you know, marginally several percent at the higher end doesn't intuitively make a lot of sense to me as just a market analyst. And then you look at, well, what's the bigger picture? The bigger picture is, again, this year with global GDP expected to grow somewhere closer to 4% than 3%, that's about, on most estimates, about 2 million barrels per day of more petroleum demand that's going to happen over the next 12 months. In addition, because the price has been so cheap for the past five or six years, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of capex in more traditional oil plays has not been spent. So decline rates are two and a half to three and a half million barrels per day. So every year, you gotta come up with five million replacement barrels just to balance the global market. Shale, all due respect to Andy, and I know he's a, he's a brilliant guy with a great career, shale alone at these prices is not gonna be the solution to that. Shale's gonna have to grow. Shale's gonna ultimately have to be 10, 12, maybe 15 million barrels a day to balance a global balance sheet that's gonna require that. I, I mean, just one, I think the key thing from my perspective and investor perspective, I think sometimes there's too much of a focus where oil prices go down and it's stuck and it's, you know, we went, the market went down so we can't make money. I think as, as um, you know, we discussed, it's, it's the movement, right? It's whether things are changing that's going to determine whether people like us um, are extinct or can make money in the markets. And uh, things are most definitely moving in commodities. I mean, shales, Permian's about 3 million barrels a day. There's 3 million barrels a day of spare capacity sitting in OPEC in Russia right now, which may or may not come back online. And that is going to have a heck of a lot to do with what volatility is going to do and what investment returns are going to do, bullish and bearish, um, going forward. So for us, we're more focused on how the market is changing than focusing on one specific thematic idea and playing off of that for both returns and price. So to try and summarize then, sort of long-term drift and some sort of duration can give you material returns that's not tied to daily volatility. While daily volatility might be on average, somewhat lower. The tails are much longer and much fatter in the current environment. For example, if I'm going to trade negative in power at $9,000 in the same year, you'd argue those are pretty long, fat tails. Right. So um, that aspect in terms of that. The doctor creates a touch on something I'm curious, since Adam brought up humanitarian, which is, of course, a central part of commodity trading. Um, and uh, disregarding the humanitarian consequences of oil production in countries like Venezuela, have you thought about the actual consequences of your world, okay? In other words, if you go to that world where EV and everything else is as dominant, crude oil demand will go negative. We can argue what time and duration it is, but in that paradigm, we will. So you're looking at the major source of revenue for Iran, Iraq, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the instability that would come if we go to $10, $20 crude, or Venezuela, or fill in, and also the agricultural impoverishment 
Because if you look at 35% of the U.S. corn going to the ethanol market, 55% of Brazilian sugar cane going to ethanol, all of that, whether you want to talk demand or their cost curve, is tied into petroleum. If all that plummets, then you're going to drive their profitability to negative. Any thoughts about, yes, it's great that we're going to a cheaper, energy-free world, but the disruptions that you would get geopolitically and humanitarian from that? Yeah, I mean, that is an interesting question. And, um, you know, what I would say is that suggests that we should preserve the current world at all costs because it's stable, right? And not because we can take out a lot of cost from their energy bills that everyone pays globally and not benefit from it, right? If we can take out and take uh, significant cost out of subsistence level requirements, um, you know, there are people in Africa that get under $12 a day that are paying a uh, dollar a day on kerosene still, right? If we could eliminate that and provide them with an integrated PV and lithium ion battery pack, you know, that gives them the ability to, uh, uh, you know, have charge their cell phone, uh, you know, watch TV if they want to have watch TV, et cetera, um, and we can finance that at a rate that is well below that dollar a day, why would we not do that in the name of creating a social harmony and a democratization? And the nice thing about these technologies is, yes, while there is a supply concentration of where they're produced right now, in terms of once they're disseminated, they become highly democratized. The sun shines everywhere. The wind blows in most places. We can start to talk about um, you know, the ability to free ourselves from uh, natural um, uh, you know, bounties that countries have created because there is a, a very high level of corruption index relative to the natural resources that these countries have been given. And that's no, no secret and has been analyzed quite extensively, right? Um, so this, in some ways, this is potentially a break. Now, it does pose a major problem for national accounts when we look globally. Um, you know, and, and we can talk about oil majors, but most of the, the uh, oil reserves in the world are controlled and managed by countries, right? And that is exactly to this point of stability and what, is the, what are the vested interests in the world that could be conflicted with any large-scale transition that we have here. I might push back. We say the sun shines everywhere. I don't think you've lived long enough in London. For some uh, <laughs> um, I actually have lived in London, so I understand your comment. But I might come back to the there. just final point before we open for questions to that gentleman, and that is the, the question you raised of the unintended consequences of if and when we get to incredibly cheap energy, I think is going to be really interesting. And that I actually think the probability, because we'll be in an AV or autonomous vehicle mode by then as well, of complete gridlock in that you know you have um, a mom off doing errands, sending another car off to pick you know my daughter up at dance, and you know my son from school. There's three different cars. Versus, you know, is I think it'll be really interesting. Okay, the the side effects that come from incredibly cheap energy and the unintended consequences of some of this that I think would be fun to explore. And some of that being instability on the scale of what you've seen in Syria, in the Middle East because of the disarray in terms of what's driven their income and the human rights crisis local there, which maybe we can forget here, but would still be something and have ramifications for Europe and some of our allies. Um, so anyway, on that point and that uh, uplifting point, um, questions from people? But are there any questions for any people on the panelists here at all, for, for any of the panelists? For, for Dr. Kreitz, one question, and it's relevant to everybody else's response. I've just spent a month in China. Um, how, how possible is it that you are dramatically underestimating the speed of change in China? Because my assessment is, is that it is, things are moving at a much more rapid pace than we, even, than we ever imagined here in the and you've obviously been very involved on the ground there. Yeah, I, I don't think most Americans understand at all what's going on in China or the pace and scale. And I, I gave that Shenzhen example just so you all could start to digest the, what exactly is happening, right? China is still, they're in the process of 
building an entire economy's worth, an entire U.S. economy's worth of new cities, right? They're urbanizing at the rate of about 12, 12 million people a year, um, uh, you know, which is adding one major New York metropolitan area every year. And they're doing so with increasingly uh, extreme attention to the economic or the environmental impacts as well as the economic ones. And so the notion of using technology at scale to help solve this is inherently embedded within uh, the mindset. It's in, uh, you know, businesses there are largely instruments of state policy. Um, and so you do see this massive scaling, whether it be energy efficiency, uh, you know, and products that are in how they're designed and incorporated into buildings, whether it be all the way to how, what vehicles are available and, and how they're created. Now, China doesn't always do that in the most efficient way. Um, you know, there are lots of examples of, uh, you know, quality standards that aren't uh, uh, upheld, et cetera. But the overall pace and magnitude of scale is literally earth changing. Um, and I, I would encourage you, if you haven't really looked into it, and I, for those who are, you guys are smart commodity traders, so you know China drives a lot of what happens. Um, but you know, understanding on the ground what the impact of some of these policies are uh, is really important because it will shift the, the trajectory of these technologies. But I'd be, I'd be curious from, from you all, uh, how much does, does China play into your day-to-day and -day how you think about your different responsibilities? Well, at the turn of the, the last century, right, Chinese petroleum consumption was about three and a half barrels per day per thousand people, okay? The U.S. it's 60, Japan, Germany, it's about 30. Right now that number is nine. And every single year, again, it's sort of repetitive, Chinese petroleum consumption goes up. Went up last year, it's gonna go up this year. So I, I take your point that the pace, it's sort of, I actually have a, a question back at you, which is there's the absolute magnitude, right? You're talking about 12 million urban residents, a new Manhattan skyline every year. The call on commodities generally, whether it's steel, all sorts of energy, but also per capita energy consumption, right? That is, you know, mind blowing, right? And that's really been the main driver of the commodity markets for the past couple of decades. The fact that they are aggressively pursuing alternatives is, is meaningful, but I believe just on looking at their consumption of old school commodities, that it's dwarfed by that growth. That growth is being fueled largely by consumption of fossil fuels in the short run. And that short run could be another decade, who knows, two decades. I, you know, I don't have a view on precisely when that inflection point happens. But then they come over to India. So where's India right now? India is at three and a half barrels per day per thousand people, exactly where China was 20 years ago. And if India starts to go on that curve, right, you know, I take it they want to have all electric vehicles by 2030. Hopefully, you know, I, I, I share the, um, the, the goal of wanting to see that develop. But my sense is that when societies like that look at the choice between rapid economic and industrial growth and development, right, and fossil fuels are there and, and plentiful and relatively cheap, they're going to just consume more of those in the short run. So that's how, you know, China is, is yeah. the swing. Asia generally is the swing. And to try and put some numbers to that, and it comes into, I thought John made an excellent point in that what drives this and drives your demand is your sort of GDP per capita growth. You grow GDP per capita, their energy demand goes up. And as you know from being in China, you're coming out of the most draconian crackdown due to environmental and emissions that you've probably ever seen anywhere, okay, over this past winter. Despite that, in March, your year-on-year -year demand growth in China for petroleum was 500,000 barrels per day. So. Yes, it probably would have been materially higher without that and without the other changes, but coming into Adam's point to put actually hard numbers this year in the midst of that crackdown, you're still seeing very uh, material in terms of the total demand growth for the world uh, change there. John, I mean, I don't know if you... Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to throw another, uh, call it a pitch or whatever, for active management. I, I, I'm always skeptical of sort of structural arguments in oil uh, trading um, because you know, I started in 2003, and uh, uh, at Goldman, all the sort of smart-looking traders would get a copy of Twilight in the Desert by Matt Simmons. I'm sure Dwight's familiar with the, the book. And, and this was like what the smart, 
the step above intellectual oil trader would read, and that was that, um, particularly in Saudi Arabia, but also in other places, he extended the analogy further, we were in this structural decline in oil production, most pronounced in Saudi Arabia, oil was gonna go to $200 a barrel because the Saudis were running out of crude. It could not have been more wrong. Um, same thing on the demand side. I mean, uh, sort of talk about structural trends in demand. Um, one of the big trades when, right before I started the, the, the fund at Glencore with the structural declines in gasoline demand and NAFTA demand because of efficiency gains, et cetera. Then we had refinery outages in the US East Coast and gasoline cracks went to the moon. Uh, two years ago, diesel demand actually was declining in China. Uh, there was a, the Chinese are very good at being counter-cyclical when the economy is growing well in the world. They, they add accelerant or, or take accelerant away. Uh, and diesel demand started actually to decline in China. It was down about 150, 200,000 barrels a day. Now it's growing again, and it's growing again because the economy is doing better. So, um, you know, as, as traders, um, we certainly have an eye, I mean, the technology is fascinating. We have an eye on the long term. Uh, but I'm just inherently skeptical of these. We are in a structural bull or a structural bear market, which makes me also very skeptical of the, we're in a structural bear market for trading because of X, Y, Z technology change. To, yeah, to put an exclamation point on that, <clears throat> technology, technological disruption actually creates market, market opportunities for us by disrupting things and causing changes. There are rebound effects in demand when price gets too low. All of those things create value for active managers in the spaces that we're in. I would say as well, just that China is going to, you know, I've been at the core of their energy strategy and it, they are going to continue to grow petroleum consumption through about 2036 or so. But it's all within even the most aggressive plan that they have in place right now. So there's not, it's not a question about that structurally. Um, but they are trying to decouple the carbon content, and it starts first with coal being pulled out of the system more. Yeah, more of an active management question than a uh, more of an active management question than a disruption question. And the panelists can even take their pick. Uh, I was just wondering if anybody had any interesting uh, uh, comments in terms of uh, China opening up their commodity markets, uh, Saudi Aramco I IPO, uh, MBS or uh, Saudi Arabia in general, uh, the renegotiation of the, uh, the uh, Iran deal, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, energy prices moving up, but uh, energy equities uh, not following. Guys, definitely <laughs> passing out. <laughs> oil guys. You can start with seven minutes <laughs> left. taking notes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make a, a quick um, observation about the the Iran deal, which obviously May 12th is, is, is a fairly uh, important inflection date. Um, the, uh, what appears to be the relative success thus far of the Korea policy, in other words, the administration using rhetoric that no one could have ever imagined, but taking substantively sort of what appeared to be a much harder line than the foreign policy establishment had been pursuing for essentially decades, if that actually bears the fruit that it apparently may, that in my view will embolden the administration to take a similarly, you know, tear up the paper hard line as it relates to Iran. So from, from, from that Korean example, I think that increases the likelihood that we may see, um, you know, that deal completely, you know, scotched and, and new negotiations start. The one caveat obviously being that we are dealing with a mercurial um, administration, so you don't really know with a lot of certainty what, what is actually going to happen. But that's just one observation we have geopolitically as it relates to that event coming up. Yeah, I mean, a lot to talk about. I'll, I'll change a little bit to OPEC policy. I mean, our, our expectations are up until the point that there's, whether it's an IPO or just some type of liquidity event, uh, we would expect the sort of OPEC Russia uh, alliance to hold in place, uh, which is which is rather constructive for oil prices. Uh, we do think that will change, um, but it's not changing in the immediate time horizon. For what it's worth, just two comments on that: is I do think the IPO is a joke, and that no um, return-based Western investor I can see would would believe that that capital would be allocated to the highest best use for. Uh, their sh shareholder return. So if it gets done, whether it's in the Saudi market and or somewhere else, 
it's going to get pulled off um, with the help of strategic investors who have uh, collateral agreements to benefit from either with Saudi or Aramco directly, as opposed to it being done on a merits-based valuation basis, in my opinion. And in terms of the energy equities, um, we actually do think that a number of them are actually cheap because um, it's not so much that uh, we're structurally bullish medium term on a number of the energy prices, but if we're not bullish because of people's improvements in productivity and higher capital efficiency, then that should uh, come into play for some of the individual producers. And so I think that there's a bifurcation where there's some individual producers where the free cash flow they're going to be able to generate in returns isn't fully being priced in. Any other questions? Thanks. Uh, question for John Kreitz. Uh, love the long-term outlook, um, but uh, to put some of this in perspective, you know, Tony Siba published his book, um, Q3 2014, if I recall yeah. correctly. I talked to him in 2015 and asked him, does the fact that oil fell from $100 a barrel to $40 a barrel affect your long-term or your outlook of the, of the pace of the change? He said, nah. Uh, and I can't help but think that, you know, there's enormous amount of infrastructure change in how this disruption occurs, right? Tony C has done tons of research on how quickly that disruption has occurred in a number of different things. But this isn't just building a bunch of cell phones and, and putting them in people's hands. This is a dramatic infrastructure change across the world. And there's so many cycles involved. There's capital cycles, there's demand cycles, supply cycles, all sorts of other economic cycles, right? Mm -hmm. Any of which could mean a, a pretty significant delay or, or even acceleration, but generally all these things have to fall together. So the question is, how much of a chance is there that the idea of this thing happening so quickly is, is really, really far off uh, from what we expect it to be? Yeah. I so there, there's a lot embedded in that question, right, in terms of to think through. There are certain elements that I think we can say are going to move really fast, right? And the things that are faster than you or I expect are the ones that are more software driven, right? Are the ones where we start talking about, you know, with a $5 chip, I can actually upgrade my uh, hot water heater to be able to start talking to an Amazon Echo, right? Um, and have that actually save me money uh, from day one, right? And have a payback of less than six months. And yeah, there's gonna be some question of whether you or I spend the time and it's worthwhile to actually do that. But eventually it's gonna get so easy that we're gonna say, oh, what the heck, right? For a, saving a couple hundred bucks a year, go ahead, go crazy, right? And when we add all that up, it starts to change the energy system pretty substantially, right? The deployment of capital is more challenging, right? And where exactly we've got stranded assets that are gonna be out there that, you know, some of which have been guaranteed a rate of return over a life cycle, some of which are in the market and, and are either gonna to lead to shareholder or, or other losses, um, right? Uh, that's gonna be harder to work through. Um, uh, and, you know, there's this inequity on a region by region basis as well that, you know, clearly the affordability in Europe is very different from the affordability in, in developing world. Uh, and so uh, what they're doing is gonna move at a different pace and scale. But uh, you know, when we look you know, in particular at the cost levels of production that this industrialization is having, um, particularly on solar, right? Because that's the one that where we see a technology pathway and a production pathway to continuously drive this down. You know, that's the thing that I look at and I scratch my head and say, at what point does the marginal cost argument break down? And does the all-in capital build up? And do new business and financing models come out that just make it, you know, happen from day one, right? Where it, it overrides the political interests uh, of a smooth transition. It may not ever reach that tipping point, you know, and it may all be a smooth transition. And in some ways, it benefits us if it is, because disruption, you know, uh, can be painful and dislocating uh, at social levels in many different ways. Um, for you guys, actually, it's act oftentimes it's better if there's more volatility and disruption in the market. So you can look at it that way as well. But I would, you know, I would be 
more careful and watching out more for how IT plays in to harnessing all those energy assets that are out there. The emerging, yes, storage is going to play an important role, especially in transportation. I just don't see it as the critical role in the near term because there are lots of other energy producing and consuming assets in particular that are going to be integrated before that reaches the relevant scale. Right? So. All right. I want to thank uh, the panelists all for their thoughtful comments and time and appreciate everyone here. So thank you very much.